Today we are going to tell you all about locking and what we have learned throughout all of our locking experiences. We're going to be talking about the five phases of locking as we continue locking throughout the day today. Hi, we're Jen, Elliot, and Ollie. In 2019, we left the United States and backpacked through 11 countries, all before deciding to come back home and try something completely new, pivoting into boat life. Our current adventure is America's Great Loop, a 6,000 mile journey through small towns, big cities, and the wilderness from the eastern portion of the United States, through the Great Lakes and Canada, and down the Midwest rivers, all aboard our home on the water, Pivot. Make sure you subscribe as we share our journey through the highs, lows, and everything in between. Good morning from the Peterborough Lift Lock, the tallest hydraulic lift lock in the world. We locked through yesterday and stayed here for the night. Hey. Hey. Let's go do some locks. Yeah. Today is a perfect day to show you guys how to lock because we are smack dab in the Trent Tavern and we have over 10 locks that we're doing today. Well, at least that's the plan. We'll see how far we get. We have successfully gone through a variety of locks, including the Dismal Swamp, the Virginia Cut, the Eastern Erie Canal, the Oswego Canal, and now we are halfway through the Trent Severn Waterway for a total of 43 locks. Now, we are not experts, and we still have a lot of locks to go. The rest of the Trent Severn and all of the locks going down the Midwest rivers. However, we have learned a thing or two, and we thought we'd share it with you. In this video, we're going to be talking about the five phases of locking. Preparation, approaching, entering, locking actually inside the lock, and exiting. The first thing to know is that all the canal systems we've been through, the Erie and the Oswego, they have a time that they open, so they do not run 24-7. For the Trent Severn, the canal that we're on right now, they start operations at 9 a.m. And it changes sometimes by seasons. The Erie Canal, I believe, started at 8 a.m., so they all vary and widely differ. And then they will close right around the workday end, so 5 p.m. or 6 p.m., depending on the day of the week. Sorry for getting you out of rhythm. <laughs> Getting their workout in. things to prepare the boat for the lock. The first is that we get our PFDs. Well, not required in every lock. They are required in some, and they're just generally a good idea. 
The last thing I do is that we have gloves and I get those ready because some of the locks you'll be using lines and those lines are really gross. They are just covered with like algae and dirt. So depending upon the lock is kind of what I know to get ready. Typical show and show fashion. This lock really crept up on us. I mean, we knew it was here, but it just like poked around the corner. So we weren't quite as prepared as we should have been. Jen did not have her life jacket on, but has it on now. Check. And I thought we were gonna be docking starboard side, like we like, but we had left all of our stuff on the port side from our last lock. So, but everything else, everything went well. things that I do to get the boat ready on the deck level and I'll take you around and show you first as I get our lines out I have one line at each side both port and starboard bow and stern it's kind of different for each lock because on the Erie Canal we would only use lines at our midship but on the Trent Severn we've only been using lines at our bow and our stern and as well for the dismal swamp canal we used lines at our bow and our stern so it really depends on the lock system which you'll kind of get used to and you'll know as soon as you're going through and you can ask the first lock tender which usually the very first lock tender at the at the start of any waterway will give you the lowdown for what to expect going forward in between each lock I tie them up on the railing so that way they're off the deck so that way they're not a safety hazard and that way it's kept neat and tidy and I can easily unwrap them and then be able to wrap them around a line. And the other thing that I do is I have the line set up, like locked on to the cleat. So that way it's not going to slip off. I don't like it when the line is just like this because the line's moving and it could easily like slip off. Whereas the line is locked on like this, I can rest assured that it is not going to remove from the cleat. So that's how I get our lines ready. The next thing I do is I get our fenders ready. We have seven fenders aboard Pivot and I put six of them on one side and I rotate them between vertical and horizontal. So here you can see I have a horizontal fender and a vertical fender. So this vertical fender, since we're at the top of a lock wall, at every single pole, there is a fender. The last thing I found is at the bow, I want this horizontal fender because if the water is pushing us in a certain way, this horizontal fender will provide us with the most protection if our, if our bow gets turned a bit because the whole shape is going in, whereas I, I keep it really tight to the top so I know the fender will protect us. There are a lot of looper boats and boats in general that have the really large ball fenders specifically at the bow to, to account for the curvature of the hull. Now another thing that some boats do is that they have a fender board which is basically a 2x4 or a 2x6 that has lines tied on either side like they drill a hole through and they put a line through it and then they put that on top of their fenders and that is to protect the fenders from the algae, dirt, and growth and all the gunk that is in the locks. We don't do that, we just clean our fenders. I'll clean them after we get through all of the locks, 
but that's just our approach. The very last thing that we do to prepare for a lock is we have our boat poles. We have two boat poles aboard Pivot and we have one at the bow and one at the stern. Now they have their spots so like on either side of the boat, port and starboard, as we're cruising. But as soon as we're getting ready to go to into a lock, I get them out of their like away position and I put them at the bow and the stern. So that way, whatever side of the boat I'm on, I have a boat pole and I am ready. Whether that's to push off of something or to quickly grab onto a line, a cable or whatever. It makes it a lot easier. Our second lock for today, which is lock 23 on the Trent Severn, is right after the last one. So we are going to continue with the locking tips afterwards. Step two is approaching the lock. Now, the big question is, are you allowed to enter the lock or do you need to wait? And the way that you determine that is different in different locking systems. So the Erie Canal, they had a series of lights. Red light, stop, green light, go. On the Trent Severn, we've had doors open. That means come on in. And if you're ever questioning it, they have a lot of lock staff to say hi. But it will vary every lock because even the Peterborough lift lock, they had a lighting system as well. And a lot of the locks on the Erie, the lock tenders had radio access, so you could call out. And then on the Trent Severn, nobody has radio access, it's all cell phone, but each of the locks, they have a megaphone. So don't worry if you're doing something wrong, take it nice and slow, they'll tell you if you are. Now, if you can't go in because other boats are locking or the tenders aren't ready for you, you have two options, either hold position or a lot of times they'll have a wall. And so in the Trent Severn, the wall will have a blue stripe on it. That's the stripe that you want to stay at to tell the tenders, I want to leave. And if you stay overnight, that's how you tell the tenders, I want to leave first thing in the morning. We typically prefer to tie off if we're waiting because a lot of these locks, there's a dam right next to it. And with the dam comes a lot of current. So it's a lot easier to come in, tie off, and just wait, and then go into the lock afterwards. Etiquette dictates that you go into the lock the order that you arrive into the lock. So in these set of boats right here, we were the first boat into the lock, so we are the first boat leaving the lock. Now, in some of the locks, due to any of the weather conditions or how the water comes in or how many boats there are, the lock tenders may shift you around. And in that case, you take their you take what they're saying, you move around, and then if you need to switch back into order because of any external factors, you can do that after you exit the lock. Since we're the first boat and the gates are open, we are clear to enter. Kind of with the preparation step that we mentioned, we asked the previous lock tender which side we were gonna lock because they're all in communication. They told us port side tie. So we're prepared for the port side tie and uh, now it's just time to execute.
The third step is entering the lock. So as you're going into the lock, you'll want to be clear with your crew, so Elliot is very communicative to me, ahead of time to tell me which line he wants first. Typically for us, locking is very similar to docking. So for us, we typically want our stern line on first. And I'll be communicating to him how far away we are from the lock wall, how far away I am from a cable, and so on and so forth. So as soon as we get into the lock, I'm able to use the boat hook to hook on to the cable, kind of give a little pull towards the wall, and wrap a line around that stern cable. Then I'm able to quickly move forward along our side deck to our bow line and put the bow line around the, the bow cable. On the Erie Canal, we used a midship line if there was a cable or a pole available to us. But if there wasn't, if that wasn't available, we used their lines, which we did a bow and a stern line, and we just did the S curve around the cleat. We did not tie it to the boat at all. The biggest tip for going into the lock that we learned is to go extremely slow. There is no rush in this process. You just want a safe, um, successful locking. That's the, that's the goal. Lastly, pretty much every lock that we've traveled through thus far has a flag at it, usually the country flag. We look at that flag every single time that we are going through a lock, specifically looking for what direction is the wind going and how strong is the wind blowing. So that way we can kind of see like, are we getting pushed on a wall? Or are we being pushed away from a wall? And trying to be mindful that the wind may act in kind of strange ways in the lock. Typically it's pretty calm in the lock. We have been through a lot of locks where the lock is rising, but not many where it's coming down. So our experience of a lock coming down is a little bit less, but typically you'll have somebody helping to grab a line for you to then wrap it around because there could be a considerable height difference for you. the line in my hands and as soon as I have my hand on the cable and on the line I'm able to just like move all of the line around the cable and then I just quickly like tie it onto the cleat. We simply tie it off just so I can go to the bow and do the bow line so that way at least like one line is secure once we're secure on the wall bow and stern Elliot comes down turns off the engine and then he's at the stern line and I'm at the bow line and we each monitor our lines typically we untie the line as we're monitoring it um, and we just kind of like finagle the line but it really depends on the lock like how much finagling is needed. Mm. The danger and the risk is that if your line gets caught either lower or above, your boat can be attached to the wall and then pivot off the wall and the water level could be a much higher or lower. It could either one, rip your cleat off or it could like, your boat could be hanging on the wall, which is really dangerous. And which is why I keep a, a rope knife on me when we're going through the locks. Is it a hot one today? Now for this next lock, this is lock 26. We're gonna show you guys how I'm helming the boat to come in nice and slow. And basically the gist of it for us, and every boat is different, you're gonna wanna practice your small boat, um, tight maneuverability and low speed handling. Cause that's very different than just cruising. For us, that means a lot of time in neutral. Neutral's our best friend. I'm jockeying it in and out of gear, constantly moving my wheel to position the boat correctly. And then my goal is to go super slow and kind of aim in to port side, since that's how we're docking. And then I have my bow thruster on and enabled, so that way I can use it when I need it. And what I've learned is that it's a much easier this is just, again, this is for pivot. It's much easier to direct yourself with your uh, engine and your wheel, and then use the bow thruster for tiny minute adjustments. 
rather than just planning to use the bow thruster to move the boat. It will work that way too. We did that for a lot of docks, but it's just a little bit smoother if you can kind of get your boat where it needs to go and then use your bow thruster. That's not the case every time, but that's just what it's been for these locks. We also learned, use your bow thruster when you need and use it a lot. Hello, how are you? Great. Like I'm still in neutral now. I'm gonna let it coast quite a ways. And I'm positioning my wheel because I can see the boat turning a little bit to starboard. So I'm positioning my wheel to port, back out of neutral. Letting the boat glide. I'm going a little fast. So I'm gonna reverse. And then back into neutral. Uh, my bow kind of going a little closer. So I have my wheel hard over for a rudder to the right. So it's gonna bring my backside in. And I just tap the bow thrust. Always slow down. Remember you can always go fast. And you don't you only want to go as fast as you want to hit something. Now we're getting a little close, so I'm going to put my wheel the other way, bump the stern out a little bit, just to kind of in inch along the wall. I got the cable. Jen just told me she got the cable, which is good. And I came a little close to the wall, but that's why we have all the fenders out. Jen just told me the stern line is fully on, so now I know I'm just going to keep an eye on the bow. Make sure we don't come too far forward because we are at the front of the lock. And there's normally a little platform at the top. And I have my finger on the bow thruster to keep it close enough for Jen. And now that the bow line's tied off, that's it. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. Okay, you're clear. All right, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome, take care. Thanks. All right. To me, it's a lot easier. Actually, I don't know, dock in locks, it seems like it's easier to get off than it is to get on. But normal docking, it's the opposite. So, but anyway, on to the next one. Passing through this beautiful town called Lakeview it reminded me that a lot of the canals have speed limits. Now for the Trent Severn, I don't know about the overall speed limit, but they'll have these signs for 10 kilometers an hour and that's their slow speed signs, like no wake signs. So um, on the Erie, it's all no wake when you're, pat when you're around any sort of structure like lock wall or other boats. So that, that, those are the requirements. For lunch today, we're kind of having a makeshift charcuterie board. It's the leftover cheeses from our docktails the other night, and then some fruit and some nuts. 
some hummus. The lunch of champions. The lunch of an easy boater. Now, as we're approaching lock 27, the doors are closed and there's a red flashing light. So we know that they're either not ready for us, there's someone in the lock, there's something going on. So we're gonna go to the side of the wall. Since we're already prepared on our port side, we're gonna probably tie up on our port side, even though it's not the blue wall and then just speak with the lock tenders. The lock tenders here at the Trent Seven Waterway are incredibly friendly. They are some of the just kindest Canadians out there, I'm convinced. Absolutely. Step three is how to handle your boat while you're inside the lock. Now, the big thing to know is that the water level can rise fast or slowly. It can affect the back of the boat, the front of the boat. Other boats can break free. So rule number one is stay attentive. Man your lines and keep an eye overall on the situation. Once I've cleated the lines, then we go to our manned stations and we uncleat the line, which is very, very important. We put it in an S shape and that's it and we just man the line and, and make sure it's not too taut or too loose throughout the locking process speaking of i'm gonna go back to my line <laughs> you can really see if it's getting caught up or not because it'll be way too tight in this situation there's still plenty of space Well, we did hear that this lock had ice cream, Corthus ice cream, which we heard is delicious. But there is no room to tie off, so uh, we have to keep going, which is perfectly fine. It's better for our uh, fitness anyway. And there's always ice cream elsewhere. Maybe at our final destination. On to the next one. I got this feeling, yeah, it's stirring in my bones. It's got me dreaming. Chasing that golden coast. One thing that I didn't say when we were in that last lock, but we've shown a couple times, is that you need to turn off your engines in the lock, and you're also supposed to turn on your blowers. We have had one scenario where a boat had problems restarting, and so they asked the lock tenders if they could leave their engines running, and the lock tender said it was kind of up to the other boaters in the lock. Um, so that has happened once, but everybody else has turned off their engines and it makes more sense. You don't have fumes, you don't have any like spills, um, and you save diesel and gas, so it's just a good thing. This area is really giving me the Thousand Island vibes. We are right now in Stony Lake and there are islands scattered throughout the waterway and they are so tiny. Some of them have little cottages on them and some of them have little patios or outdoor space on other islands. And then there's little bridges in between. It's super cute. It's just been really, really adorable. And this area is just 
absolutely stunning. It is so pretty. We just passed St. Peter's on the Rock Church, which is an Anglican church located here in Stony Lake. This church is only accessible by boat, and they have services July and August throughout the summer. Oh, oh my gosh. So deep. How deep is it? 52 feet. Oh my gosh. How pretty. This archipelago of islands just extends for miles all the way to our starboard side. And wow, it's just gorgeous. There's so many different network of channels and you can tell the locals because they're just sipping around outside the channel. No way, <laughs> I would never do that uh, unless I was from here. Now we're going through Hell's Gate. There's quite a few Hell's Gates on the loop actually. First one I think was in Savannah. I wonder what the reasoning behind that is. If you know, leave it in the comments below. I don't know what it is, but it smells really good. It smells woody and earthy, and you can hear the birds chirping. It's very... It's summer camp. It's summer camp. <laughs> Canada in the summer is amazing. Absolutely amazing. We're at the next lock and we are having the joy of locking with a houseboat, I believe. So we're gonna be even beta, more beta than we are. Maybe they're just tying up. They're docking. So we are going into the lock, which is another summer boat. Step five, exiting the lock. You guys have seen, this, seen us do that many times. Basically, you leave the way you come in, and if there's any doubts or any questions, you just talk to the other people in the lock. So the tenders will, will kind of help you out because there's no wind. I mean, you're really close together, so communication is key. And that last lock, we came in third, but since we're on the port side, we came up to second place. But then I just talked to the boat behind us and said, you guys can go ahead. Uh, and we'll come out afterwards if that's okay with you. And that's what they wanted to do, so all is, all is good. Uh, and that is our approach to locking. So if you guys have any questions or comments or tips of your own, make sure to put them in the comment below. For now, we're gonna continue cruising, find a spot to lay up for the night. We might still have one more lock, we might still have two more locks, we might have zero more locks. We're gonna try to find an anchorage and navigate this beautiful waterway together. The channel can be so narrow sometimes with the rocks on both sides. Yeah, pretty crazy. Pretty crazy.
And here's a circumstance where uh, the boat was locking up as we came in, so we just decided to tie to the blue wall. Since we're on the blue wall, it is clear that we are going through. We still wave to the tender just to make sure though. Lock tender here at um, Love Six said that this is the only lock that uh, is not accessed by land. So that boat is there <laughs> to be to work, which is pretty awesome. We have only one more lock today, and that is the Buckhorn Lock. Lock 31 here on the Trans Severn. We'll be getting pretty much the last lock through. ETA is 512. Last lock through in the Trans Severn is 530. So it'll be a full day of locking. Honestly, it kind of like wrenches our gut a little bit to go through all of these amazing spots and not be able to stop and spend time. Unfortunately, that's just how the loop goes. There's just not enough time to spend time everywhere. We always put our video uh, filming dates in the description, but right now it's the end of July, which means if we're trying to get through um, to Chicago by sometime in September, the end of September is our goal, we have two months to do the Georgian Bay and to do all of Michigan. And with worse and worse weather, we're gonna have less and less weather windows, which means you have to just make miles when days are good, like today. All it means is that you have to come back and have to do parts of it again not a bad thing. We made it to the Buckhorn Lock. Woohoo! Right there, I think. Yes, right over there. Thought it was over here. Right over there. Not too far. Okay, bow line is off. Okay, stern line is off. And I gave a stern the push. All right, three feet clear. Thank you so much, this is great. Stern first, yeah. Yeah, you look fine back here, babe. Like six feet, eight feet maybe. Looking good. Excellent. Thank you. No problem. Just We've... tie it up how you want. Yeah. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect timing. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Thank you for your help. We appreciate no it. Thank you very much. We got a tower. Tower. We got a spot with power tonight in a very hot commodity. We got a spot with power. <laughs> oh, my God. oh my gosh. <laughs> sometimes uh, life life is funny sometimes. 
Cheers to a solid day locking. We did 10 locks today, I'm pretty sure. 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. But I think actually we did nine locks today because I think one of those didn't exist. We skipped one of the numbers. We did a lot of locks today. Cheers. Cheers. I hope you guys learned something about locking. Or maybe just this along for the ride, which is also fun. We're going out tonight. Jen made some kebabs. Rain rainbow kebabs. Rainbow, not just kebabs, rainbow kebabs. So I got my sun protection. And right now I'm making a barbecue sauce. And as soon as we're done with dinner, we will tell you our final tips, tricks, like things that we're thinking about, but not necessarily one of the steps. Come on! Come on! Jump, Come girlfriend. on! This is how they came out. Barbecue sauce still needs some love, but um, that's okay. To be continued. But they look really good. There's red onion, red bell pepper, yellow bell pepper, orange bell pepper, pineapple, mushrooms, and some tofu with the barbecue sauce. Not bad. So, not bad. Man, look at Pivot right there. She did a good job today, all those locks. I know, I'm impressed. We have a nice view. Wow. It's a great view. It doesn't get much better than this, folks. Before we leave you guys today, we wanted to share two last tips. And one is about rafting, which we did not have to do today. And so with rafting, there's a couple things that you need to keep in mind. The lock tenders will tell you exactly what they want you to do. First off, listen to them. Now what you'll typically do is the boat that goes in first will tie off to the wall. And then once that boat is tied off, you're going to approach. You're gonna go nice and slow and then that boat will tie off and the, their crew members will come all, come to their port and starboard and the boat cutting in will use their lines to attach to the boat that's on the wall and so you'll coordinate with them and you'll have enough fenders out and then exiting the lock the rafted vessel so the one that's just tied to the other vessel will leave so not the order that you enter so just some differences there the boat that is rafting to the vessel will typically have fenders on either side, both sides of their boat, and the same for the boat that is on the wall. You may not think, oh, that you must need you must need fenders because you're not attached to the wall, but just in case, there's some there just for protection. What we have found is that they'll typically put the larger vessel on the wall and then the smaller vessel will attach to the larger vessel but of course like that could easily change depending upon the lock master and then finally the canals at least the Erie and the Trent Severn both have fees associated so when you go to your first lock in your Trent Severn you'll tell them what kind of pass you want and then you'll pay for it there and then you'll put it it's a sticker you'll put it on the front or somewhere visible on your boat and the same thing for the Erie. However, um, this year and the last couple years, fees have been waived on the Erie Canal. So you'll just have to see which canal you're going through and then uh, what the standard procedure is. Yeah. The Erie Canal, as well as the Oswego Canal and the Champlain Canal, is operated by the New York State Canal System. And then for Canada, you have Parks Canada that does the Trent Severn as well as the Rideau. The price of the passes depends on the size of your boat. Well, thank you guys so much for watching our video about how to lock. We hope you got a lot of good information from it and learned some things. And the great thing. You know, if you're just doing a lock here or there, that's one thing, but if you're doing the loop, you're concerned about locking, don't be too worried because you're gonna have lots of practice. You know, it will be tough the first few times, but then you'll start to get into a hang of things. And, you know, you'll learn a little bit more here along the way and yeah, and you'll be experts. Yeah. Thanks for watching. You spotted a pivot in the wild. <laughs> I'll have to start for a little bit. Holes are kind of 
like not wonky, but they're like it's a pole. Oops, don't want the GoPro going in. Dad. There you go. The show and Joe slogan of slower than slow. You're witnessing witnessing it in real life. Do you have a good day today? Going to order locks. Now you want some dinner? No food. You want some food? All right, give me a paw. Yeah.